I'm Noah Billig. I'm an Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture in the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design. Given the uncertainty of the world we live in, in this episode we are thinking about how design can be used as a response to current conditions, disaster relief, as a response to changing climate conditions, or as a response to other conditions such as the COVID-19 crisis. So what is responsive and resilient design? Responsive design is really design that's focused on a response to a shock or a disturbance. Resilience is the capacity to adapt to changing conditions and to maintain or regain functionality and vitality in the face of stress or disturbance. Resilience is both response and action. Some responsive design is a reaction to stresses in society or the environment. Sometimes these reactions can take the form of artwork, like murals. Other times they take the form of the creation of spaces, taking the creation of public spaces in the streets or other forms of public spaces where people can gather and show their right of assembly and um, show their democratic process in action. I'll be showing you some examples from Fayetteville and we'll see some examples of responsive and resilient design from other parts of the world. You'll, we'll then go through a project with our students Sloan and Bow for responsive design in our school. Programs at Tricycle Farms embody their commitment to food awareness, education, and empowerment as stewards of the earth and community builders. Their mission is to grow community through soil as they steward food awareness, education, and empowerment. Food grown at the farm is allocated using Tricycle Farms' third share initiative in which they share a third of what they grow with volunteers, give a third of the food to pantries and community meals, and sell a third to sustain the farm and demonstrate the economy of food. My name is Don Bennett. I'm the Director of Community Affairs and Development at Tricycle Farms. You know, Tricycle Farms is a two acre farm park and our engagement in resiliency is recognizing that we are a small spot on a neighborhood that is four square miles where 7,300 of our neighbors live below the level of poverty. So our response to our community is to engage neighbors in how we can grow growers, farm farmers, and also uh, uh, address the food insecurity that is right within a stone's throw of where this farm resides in Fayetteville, Arkansas. You know, how, how have we addressed the type of growing at Tricycle Farms? You know, what, what choices have we made uh, based upon this incredible two acres in the center of the city of Fayetteville. And, um, you know, we've really focused on uh, uh, our drainage patterns and we've focused on like, you know, water retention and capture. And, you know, those, you know, we, we have a saying community through soil, you know, and that has a very deep meaning to us about how important soil when a world is lost 50% of their arable soil, how do we not lose our soil, but instead not sustain it either, but build it. And you do it without tilling. You do it with companion planting. You do it with water capture in a pathwork that has been dug to raise each one of our beds. I get questions all the time, like what do you do about the squirrels eating your garden? And I answer very simply, you feed them. And at Tricycle Farms, in a diverse way through food forestry and permaculture, hugel culture, and uh, regenerative agriculture, we grow flowers and nuts and fruit that we also share not just with the community, but with the squirrels, the birds, the bees, and uh, the environment that we are in very much responsible for feeding. We're so excited at Tricycle Farms that in 2020, in the year of the pandemic, we are currently building one of the most sustainable greenhouses in the world. Insulated, double poly panels with a geothermal air transfer system that will control temperature and save energy at the same time. Uh, 
it's an important piece of the puzzle uh, that we've been building over nine years. And when that's complete, a circle is then completed within Tricycle Farms connection to the community. Uh, and that circle starts at Whole Foods and picks up recovered foods and delivers it to uh, our neighbors and our nonprofit partners. It comes back to Tricycle where we're growing food, we're growing growers and we're farming farmers. And that food is gonna be uh, cash crops that is gonna be then loaded onto the truck and then delivered to Whole Foods that sustains the jobs that we're gonna create with a jobs program having production manager, hydroponic specialist, aeroponic specialist, teaching STEM education, service learning through growing food and making sure this nonprofit is sustainable and can continue to serve its community. You know, I, I, would, I would like to make sure that I have a message to young people, high school students, K-12 kids, and college students right now. Um, COVID-19 has exposed vulnerabilities in our community that uh, are going to be inherited. And, uh, you know, I, I think engaging in community design and understanding where we live and making a positive impact in your community uh, is going to be more and more important in the future. I think uh, COVID-19 has exposed that our regional and local food systems are in danger and our farmers are averaging 60 years old. And my question to all of us in this world is where is our food gonna come from if new growers and new farmers don't uh, choose that as their vocation and their future. Another example of resilient design is the New Beginnings homeless shelters in Fayetteville, Arkansas. New Beginnings serves Northwest Arkansas and works with community leaders, faith leaders, business owners to provide solutions for um, homeless issues in Fayetteville. New Beginnings itself is an initiative that's designed to be a self-managed community of low-cost bridge housing for people in need of shelter. Bridge housing is a low cost solution for people that do not have homes and they can temporarily be housed in this bridge housing. New Beginnings is a great example of responding to local needs. Tactical urbanism is another example of local efforts with responsive design. Whether you live in a community large or small, you've likely seen it for yourself. Cities around the world are using flexible sh and short-term projects to advance long-term goals related to street safety, public space, and more. Tactical urbanism is all about action. This approach refers to a city, organizational, or citizen-led approach to neighborhood building using short-term, low-cost, and scalable interventions to catalyze long-term change. I'm here in South Fayetteville on a street with some tactical urbanism painting. My colleague Carl Smith did this with some community members two years ago in response to traffic on the street. They wanted to calm the traffic and they thought about doing it through an artistic uh, means. So tactical urbanism can be responsive um, really nimble solutions to problems that you have in your communities. Now we're at an intersection in front of the Von Richardson Center and this intersection is a great example of tactical urbanism that has now evolved into permanent infrastructure. This crosswalk was put in as a reaction to, to traffic problems and is really unsafe intersection. Um, subsequently, residents liked it. It slowed traffic down. It helped people cross the street more safely. And in the last few months, they put in um, permanent stop signs and yield signs and permanent curb and gutter and sidewalks to make this intersection more safe for pedestrians, bicyclists, and for cars. This is a great example of the progression of tactical urbanism 
from a really responsive design, on the ground, low budget, to something that becomes permanent infrastructure. Here we are at the bungalows at Compass Point. Compass Point is a restaurant and hotel here in the Bahamas. Um, so you can see that this is a hotel room and it's built up on stilts because the beach is right on this side of where we are. So the reason it's built up on stilts is because we have hurricanes here in the Bahamas. So this is built where the ground floor can be used as open free space that people can occupy whenever they're not in their rooms. And the rooms are built up on the second level so that when a hurricane comes, all of the water and rain doesn't ruin the inside of the space. Resiliency design. Hi everybody, I'm Bo Burris. I'm a fifth year landscape architecture student here at Bay Jones. And I'm Sloan Auger, and I'm a recent graduate from the interior design program here. So now that Noah and Katura have talked a little bit about what responsive design is, um, Sloan and I are gonna be running y'all through a little bit of a demo, seeking to resolve a, a problem that's been facing our campus and really our nation recently, and hopefully come up with a super tangible solution that can be implemented. So first we're gonna start with brainstorming about what our project could be again. So what's happening right now, what's current, often responsive design is related to something that's really in the moment, often very demanding and needs to have a quick solution. So what seems more relevant right now than to talk about the COVID-19 situation and how the pandemic is ultimately changing a lot of the ways that we use the space around us. Um, and we're going to think about that in sort of the context that we know, which is the studio in here and the design building as a whole. Yeah. So now that we've identified our problem, we want to start thinking about who's going to be directly influenced by this problem on campus and who are going to be kind of the administrative people we need to go through to get it done. And hopefully once we come to a solution, make it to where it can be replicated across this campus and maybe even some other universities because we're all facing this problem at once right now. And the more we share with each other about how we might be able to fix it, the more constructive and robust our solution is going to be. Once you've solidified your stakeholders, the next step is to pick out your site. We walked around Faye Jones and contemplated the different options we have in terms of the studio settings and maybe what our best options are in finding one space that helps us solve a lot of the same issues. So we ultimately ended with the reading room, which is the space that we're in right now because it's one of the largest studios here at Faye Jones and will help us solve for a lot of those big factors. So when you're choosing a site, you want to pick the site that's going to have the most impact and the most chances for replicability with the least amount of work possible. With, with responsive design, we want to go with big impact, small effort. And that's why we ultimately landed on the reading room. We feel it's going to put us in a really good position to launch into design and really dig into how we're going to address these really complicated problems. So one way we can affect change in all of the studios here at Faye Jones is through circulation. It's gonna be less about physically affecting the space and more about applying signage and floor stickers and just information that guides people through the space. It's kind of like how a lot of grocery stores right now are changing aisles to one-way streets, basically. We wanna think about doing something similar. We can put something really eye-catching on the floor and kind of start to map out, as we've sketched here, where people are going to go that they're going to pass by fewer of their neighbors, which is mm -hmm. chances for a transmission, um, where they're not going to have to squeeze through uh, desks to get to their workspace, and really just toying around with what kind of uh, flow of circulation we can have that's going to minimize these close within six feet interactions. Right. Out of the four options we have um, centering around circulation within the studio, we're leaning toward number four. It kind of replicates more how we might drive and how we walk on the sidewalk with sticking to the right side. Um, and then it's one way in and one way out of all the rows. We obviously are concerned about people not following the rules. This way it'll be easy 
everybody's moving in the same direction, no worries about somebody messing it up or it being too complicated to follow. It's really right. intuitive. So now that we've come to those decisions about maybe the studio itself specifically, those are ideas we can start to imagine on a bigger scale. So that idea of replicability that, you know, if we can solve it in the smaller context, we can start to use those same ideas in the bigger picture. So zooming out and looking at sort of the floor plan of Faye Jones as a collective and we can start to debate those same ideas as if you're coming in at the front door on the new side of the building, you always enter from the right side door and you're gonna have to travel along that right side corridor of the building until you either exit it or you can take the stairs on your right to go up. Same with the elevator, but if you were coming in from the other side, you would always take your rightmost door and take the other stairs and exit out that way. And if you wanted to change directions, you would ultimately have to take a big turn around either side of the end of the building so that we're really kind of keeping everyone traveling in the same direction constantly so it minimizes contact of people sort of sharing the same airways while passing one another. So now that we've looked at this larger scale and thought about how these circulation patterns are gonna work for the whole building, we wanna zoom back down onto a desk by desk basis and start to think about how the lower occupancy ratings of rooms are gonna affect how the desks are arranged and who can sit at which desks. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about a system that splits the desks up so that a student will never be next to another student um, and they'll like switch off which days they get to occupy their desk. This can be anything from a back and forth pattern or we're even thinking about taking these rows apart and turning the desks into little clusters where one or two students would be able to work at their cluster at any given time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are things that we can all start to, to debate and maybe these are things that you create lots of options that maybe you consider to be possible solutions and you are going to take them back to your stakeholders and really start to debate what everyone sees as the best option because you may think that option two from the student standpoint might be the best way to go, but your teachers and faculty may have another perspective based on what they feel needs to happen in order for them to teach successfully. So sometimes it helps to really take several options to the people involved in the conversation so you can get everyone in on that sort of final decision making. After talking to our stakeholders and really having those big conversations, we came up with some topics that needed some reconsideration. So while initially, idea four made the most sense in terms of circulation when presenting the possible desk solutions to our stakeholders everyone was really interested in exploring the idea of the clusters that's something that hasn't really been done here before and we feel like it could help create a lot more opportunity in terms of collaboration and you know manipulation of space as a whole but the cluster was something we hadn't really initially thought about in terms of circulation. So now that we have those comments, we're going to take that idea and start to reimagine how a new circulation layout could work to help that solution work. Yeah. This is just a lesson in responsive design when you reconnect with your stakeholders. Be absolutely open to change because these problems that we're facing, whether it's climate change or the COVID-19 pandemic, there are going to be such a vast set of problems that need to be dealt with, and that means that there's honestly an infinite number of solutions that could work. So being super communicative with your stakeholders, coming back after each round of design, and really just working these problems out with people who have a different mindset than you and have fresh eyes, which is hugely important, is gonna streamline the process, and in the end, establish a really, really strong design solution. Yeah. So with responsive design, sticking to this basic outline of brainstorming and coming up with your problems, thinking about who your stakeholders are and getting organized on that communication process, then leaping into site selection and thinking about having a really impactful site for your set of problems. And when you have a good, good firm grasp on that, you wanna move into design and start engaging with the details of how the solution can be fleshed out. And then once you have a set of propositions or a proposition, reconnect back with your stakeholders and tweak accordingly until everybody's on the same page and everybody's really happy with where the design stands. So remember with responsive design that it's different from the community design conversation we had because it's often an issue that's now. It's very present, it's come up quickly, and we haven't had a lot of time to consider how to solve for it. Um, again, with responsive design, it often helps to figure out how we can make the most impact with the least amount of effort. So 
get collaborative, start brainstorming, get those things down on paper, find your stakeholders, get in those conversations so that you all can have a big shared dialogue about what the best solution is for everyone. Thank you.